welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming tonight to the great debate. Um, this is uh, this is gonna be a really fun webinar tonight. Liza and I are gonna debate uh, the topics that you see on screen tonight. Um, you also see a, a two minute timer that we'll get that we will start. Um, we're gonna give two minutes to each topic. Um, and each of us is gonna take a side and debate the merits um, of each topic. So a few housekeeping notes, uh, questions can go into the Q and A. Um, we will definitely get to some questions at the end. Um, we're happy to answer your questions. Also closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screen. Click that if you'd like. Um, and uh, once again, thanks for coming. And Liza, are you ready? I am so excited for this. I'm ready, Drew. Okay, I, I want to make sure you're really ready because I got my game day shirt on today. I know, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready is, to take you down, Drew. Just you wait. This is this is my number one shirt out of the closet, and that just like when you see the blue check shirt, it means it's game day. So <laughs> well, listen, this is one of my favorite sweaters, my lucky sweater. So I think um, we've got a big debate ahead of us, and we're gonna have to see okay. who takes down. <laughs> All right. Let's get started. I'm ready for the first, is, is our timer ready? Can we get a timer for two minutes? Because our first topic is about early decision or regular decision. And I'm gonna say to you, Liza, that it doesn't really matter. Like we read applications exactly the same, the same transcripts, it's the same recommendations, the same content is there. And so if you apply early decision or regular decision, honestly, it just doesn't matter that much. Okay, I, I can understand what you're saying and I see your point, but surprisingly sitting in on committee for early decision, I think there are a lot of benefits for applying ED, specifically that you are applying within a smaller pool of applicants. So in my opinion, I felt like some people really stood out to me a little bit more. I remember people easily from having read their application. That's, that's just what I feel. I feel with a smaller pool of applicants, you're likely to stand out a little bit more. But you're missing what you just said. You sat in committee and we sit in committee for early decision. We sit in committee for regular decision. It's the same group. It's the same Zoom or it's the same room. The conversations are the same. It's like, isn't it just identical? Is there any real difference? I think, you know, I understand what you're saying, but again, I think one of the big things about applying early decision is that we want to see that you're interested in Holy Cross and that we really, you really want to come to Holy Cross and we really want people who are coming to Holy Cross who want to come. So oh, I don't, think- Don't, let, don't rush these people, Liza, don't rush them. Okay, yes, but, you know, we, but imagine applying early decision and then come mid-March and April when everyone else is trying to figure out where they're gonna go to college and what, um, acceptances they've got, the early decision applicants have it in the bag because they don't have to worry about it and they can enjoy their senior spring. They don't have to stress that's, about making that last decision. Liza, that's so like you to be living life, like like pedal to the metal, like all the way down the accelerator, <laughs> trying to accelerate I, everything. As someone who is, you know, a little bit of an anxious person and didn't apply ED anywhere, I see the benefits in it. I would have loved to have a stress-free senior spring, but there were so many decisions coming my way. And that's just how I see it. I think that, um, you know, you can live a little little bit if you applied ED somewhere and you know where you're going. Okay. You made some valid points, but I definitely won that one. So okay. Okay. next topic <laughs> is, is it better to get an A in a honors class or B in an AP class? So the, the lower grade in the higher level or the higher grade in the lower level class. What, what's better, Liza? Let, let's hear what you've got on this topic. So I'm gonna say that I think the B and AP is something that we like to see because we want to see our students challenging themselves. And you know, an AP course, an IB course, advanced dual enrollment courses, those are gonna be the courses that are as close to a college class as you're gonna get. And college classes are challenging and we want to see- You're doing it again, Liza. You're doing it again. The you've challenge. Pedal to the metal, accelerating everything. Let, let these kids just be in high school. Let them stay at a level that's comfortable for them, mm -hmm. that they can feel comfortable. Mental health is important. I think students should just be taking courses. I think there's a valid argument to be made for taking courses at a level that's comfortable. What do you say to that? I can understand being comfortable, but I think college is all about challenging yourself and pushing your boundaries. And we do want to see maybe specifically in courses where you're interested in potentially majoring in that academic area. We want to see you challenging yourselves. We want to see you pushing yourself. If you want to major in bio, we'd love to see you be taking AP bio or AP chem to really stretch yourself in that STEM field because there's a big difference between high school bio 
and college bio. And I can tell you so many people who I've met who came in wanting to be a bio major and have realized that it's probably not for them. And, you know, getting that B in the AP course helps you sort of see where you might fit and if that's going to be um, the right major for you. See, this is so like you to be taking advantage of a false construct. This whole idea is a false construct. The idea that you automatically get a worse grade in a higher level class. I reject the construct. And I know I'm sure, it you, I, I'm sure it was you who put this topic up for debate because I would never do this. I no. don't think you get a worse grade in a higher level. Forget next topic. I'm making my point. You, you, you do absolutely do not get a worse grade in a higher level class. What about like get the A in the AP? Like, you know who's in that higher level class? Like great teachers, motivated mm -hmm. students, and sometimes water rises to its level. So I reject exactly. the construct. And so by rejecting the construct, I won this topic as well. Okay, okay, this is a very biased person making these decisions, but um, um, I understand. <laughs> I don't think I'm biased at all. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Third topic for debate is recommendations letters. How okay. much do they really count, Liza? I think that the recommendations are just a great way to give us a little more insight into the student and a little more insight into the grades, especially, for example, there are plenty of people who do get A's in AP classes, but if someone did get a B, we can sort of understand a little bit more and see behind the scenes of that teacher telling us how hard you worked and how you know determined you were to get that B plus, to work super, super hard. And I think the recommendation letters just give us a little more insight into your transcript. And sometimes I think they tell us more of the story about who you are as a student. But don't you think all these recommendations, like, don't, after a certain point, don't they just kind of read the same? Like, are, don't they all just say they're that, that Liza is earnest and persistent and a delight to have in class? Like, can you really tell a difference between student Liza and student Drew in honors chemistry? I think that's that's a valid point, but for me, you know, we at Holy Cross, we offer, um, we have in the past before the pandemic, we've offered people the opportunity to shadow a student, but we as admissions counselors don't get an opportunity to shadow every single applicant and see how they're like in the classroom and how they interact with one another. And maybe everyone applying to Holy Cross is great and all the recommenders have great things to say, but the recommendation letters do give us a little more insight into how they interact with teachers, staff, faculty, their fellow classmates, and with their greater community. And I think that's just a good little insight into the student. There, there you go again, Liza. You are <laughs> avoiding the obvious elephant in the room. And that's what we've been going through since March 2020. Mm -hmm. In March 2020, every school went virtual. And then yeah. last year, so many were hybrid. Like, these teachers, like, they... How can we expect them to be writing insightful recommendations when maybe they don't even know these students that well? Mm. Like how much can recommendations really count if the teacher wrote a recommendation for a kid who was who, who learned virtual the entire year last year or even hybrid? Are they really that good? Well, I'm going to tell you that I have read plenty of recommendations during this application cycle thus far that have said that they've had students in a hybrid model and a completely remote model, and they've been able to write stellar recommendations telling them how, telling us how well the students have adapted to that. So there may be some of those students, but again, it comes to the point where the students need to be selecting the correct teachers to be writing those recommendations. So if they don't think that a teacher is going to be able to because of the hybrid model or the remote model, I think it's really up to the student to, to select the right teachers to write their recommendations. Okay, just to show you like what an exemplary person I am and a debater, I'm going to tip my cap to you because you. I you made a good point. It's, it's important as the superior debater to recognize when your opponent has made a good point. I as well have read lots of recommendations this year where teachers have commented on how students have comported themselves with um, when they were doing hybrid work, when they were doing remote work. And that has been as insightful, I think, as, as, um, as fully in-person teacher comments. So oh, tip of the cap there. Thank you. I think you're, I think like you always do, you're, you're out of your New Hampshire mind. You're, you're just avoiding obvious main things by missing the fact that, not even mentioning the fact that we've been hybrid and remote for so long, but um, tip of the cap to- Thank uh, you. Right there. Thank um, you. And, and, and 
as usual, you went way over time. We're in the second <laughs> two minute here. But you know, like that's what a generous debater I am. I'm giving you all this leeway to make extra points so that um, it looks like you get a little caught up. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna I'm gonna give credit for this topic so that it seems like a little fairer game so that we'll maybe you. get it a little bit closer. But, but I will let's let you know to... you you basically spoke those last two minutes, so don't blame me. <laughs> I mean the people who want to hear me. <laughs> they do. Is, they uh, do. They come okay. for you, Drew. Talking about what people want, let's talk about standardized testing. Mm -hmm. um, does it really count? Does it really matter? And I'm going to say it should matter some. Like the, the, the most important part of it is in the description. It is standardized. It is a test that everyone can take that helps admissions offices learn a little bit more about what students are capable of um, you know, devoid of like who their teacher was in English that year, and devoid of those sort of factors. It's a standardized test that gives us more information. It's not everything, but it does give us more information. What say you to that? So I'm going to disagree. I can understand that they it gives us information, but I'm going to disagree with you because I do believe that the SATs really just show us that students are, if a student is really good at taking a test and really good at sitting at a desk for four hours on a Saturday morning and using that knowledge. And I will tip my cap to all those students who are really great test takers and really good standardized test takers. I am not that person, but I will say, and to debate you a little bit more, I did not submit my test scores to any of the, score, the schools that I went to call it, that I applied to that were test optional, and I got into plenty of them. So in my opinion, I don't think they really matter that much. I think they just sort of show us that their students are good at taking a test and we don't really, we're not really able to measure their growth as a student from that one Saturday morning for four hours. Don't you agree that it's just another point, it's another piece of data that we can use because when we're trying to compare students, there's so many students, so many applications, so many honors courses, so many a minuses out there. Isn't standardized testing just another data point that we can use to help differentiate between the chunks and the champs? Perhaps, but I do think that it can also be inherently unfair because not everyone has the same access to SAT prep courses or being able to take the SAT or the ACT multiple times in a row. Sometimes people just don't have that access. So it's sort of hard to say, let's compare the chumps and the champs when the champs took the test six times, which, whoa, but and then the chump was only able to take it what, once or twice. What are you saying about me, Liza? What are you saying about me? I'm not saying anything. I just would never want to take the SAT more than once or twice. I mean, I was so close to 1600. I just had to keep taking it, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <sighs> okay. Again, again, I was generous with the time and I, you have bonus time there. Um, if, if people felt like you had the superior argument there, it's just because you had bonus time. Okay. All right, let's move on to, to something with a little more texture. What makes a good essay? Mm. Well, well, let, me, let, me, let me phrase that differently. Do, are, do essays even matter? Do they even count? Should they even count? Like, mm -hmm. well, I, don't think, I don't think they should count that much, but what do you think? Drew, I have not been doing this as long as you, so maybe I'm not as jaded, but personally- Are you calling me old? Is that a, like, is that a, is that a barb? Is that a quip? No, I, you up Drew, Drew, I, adm I admire you. You are someone that I look up to in the office, but I have not been doing this for as long as you. This is my first cycle, and in my opinion, the essays are sometimes my favorite part. I think that the essays um, help us learn something new about the student. They help us- um, really bring the application to life. It really colors the application because I can't tell you how boring it is to look at transcripts of people who have taken four years of Spanish, four years of English, four years of math, but reading the application or reading the essay is something that I really particularly enjoy. And sometimes they put a smile on my face. They make me laugh. Well, so it's um, all about <laughs> you, Liza. It's all about you, all about making you smile. Is there really anything new to learn at that point though? We've, we've read the recommendations. We've read the, the transcript. We've read so many parts of the application. Is there really thing, anything new to learn if, if a student's gonna write about doing the spring musical and what that was like at their high school in New Hampshire? Like, <laughs> is that, are we really learning something well, new I, there? Yes, and I feel like you are digging at me even though I did not write my essay on <laughs> a spring musical, but 
I think it really depends on what the student is writing about. One of the essays that I've read months ago that's still in my mind is about a student who talks about all of the people that he comes across when they're working at the um, deli stand at their supermarket. And it was just so interesting and so fascinating and gave me a little more insight into their mind. So sometimes they really stick with you and they can color the application in a really great way. I think, I mean, isn't, the, isn't it just simpler than this? Isn't it just about students proving whether they can write and whether they can write about themselves? Isn't like that essay just overblown in so many ways about like, it has to be them convincing us to get in. Isn't it more just like, it's simple. Show well, you can write and you can write about yourself. Like, isn't it just 650 words? Mm -hmm. I will give that to you, Drew. I will say that at the end of the day, you can have the most profound, interesting topic, but sometimes the writing might not be the best. Or, you know, sometimes it is about seeing the student and seeing their writing capabilities and their abilities and seeing the fact that they're going to be able to grow as a writer in college. And that's irregardless of if you're going to major in a STEM field or you're going to be an English major. Everyone's going to have to write at some point when they're in college. And so I think I can understand where you're coming from. I think there is a good point to just seeing the essay as a sample of writing and making sure that you know how to correctly use all of your punctuation and to use the Oxford comma. <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging that I had the superior um, argument there. And now it looks like our, our timer is rushing us into the last topic. And that is who gets admitted? How are decisions really made? And in my, you're, you're calling me old, so I'm just gonna just own that and just say in my my old age, my, my I've got a lot of wisdom. And the reality is, is that admissions is, is a holistic review. And I know that's a buzzword in the world of college admissions, but that means everything matters. Every piece of the application gets soaked in and by the admissions committee, by the admissions reader, and every little part matters. The, you know, whether it's the transcript, but also the recommendations, also the essay, also the activities, every little piece is a part of this puzzle. So listen, Drew, I, I do agree with you in some portion, but I'm gonna say that I think, you know, the transcript really is the key. The transcript is the cake and everything else is just frosting. I know that for, the past couple of topics, I said, I love the recs, I love the essays, and you know, I do also love frosting. So those extra little bits, delicious. They help us see the student in a different light and help us get to know the student. But at the end of the day, that transcript is going to be key. That transcript is the thing that we are looking at probably more than anything else. And we are making sure that we have, you know, annotated it to the best of our abilities. That's the cake. That's the thing that we really care about. That is, a, that is a tasty little metaphor you've served mm. up for everyone. And much like, much like I'm, you know, I'm going to do with that tasty metaphor, much like a hot dog from Coney Island hot dog in Worcester, I'm going to eat that metaphor for dinner because the reality is, is there's no cake and there's no frosting. Everything is in the soup. If this is a soup, the application is the student's soup. And every piece is an ingredient, or let's call it a burrito. Mm. Every piece is the burrito. What's the most important ingredient of the burrito? Who knows? You just know if the burrito's good or if the burrito's bad. You know what? You didn't have me there with soup because I personally don't enjoy soup, but then you <laughs> you turned it into a burrito. So I, I can understand that. But personally, I'm a dessert person. So transcript is the cake. Everything else is just frosting. So I know you said I was um, not a fair judge, but I do have a little bit of surprise for you. Um, I did hire two judges for tonight. We have two judges present and they've been, they're impartial and they are fair. And I asked both of them to be listening tonight. Um, you're gonna think it's not fair because they both live in my house. Um, but here's judge number one, Cosette Carter. Here's judge number two, Bear Carter. And they've been listening to the debate and they've been keeping a scorecard. And I've asked them to record their votes for who won the debate. And are you guys ready with your votes? Yeah. Have you decided oh who the goodness. winner is? Yep. You, have you decided who the winner is? Yep. Was it, was it a tough decision? Yep. Was it a tough oh. decision? Yep. Okay. I'm ready to have the ballots. Ready to have your ballot. Winner of the debate in ballot number one. Now, these are anonymous. We don't know which of these came from. Oh, that's a beautiful drawing. Oh my goodness, so colorful. Winner number two. 
Drum roll, please. You're fired. <laughs> You're <drowning. laughs> I think they just I think they just voted you off the island. I don't know if you're a fan of Survivor, but they totally did. <laughs> we need to increase the budget for these judges. Okay. Um that was a, a lot of fun, Liza. Thanks uh, to you for Thank all of you this. Thank you for having me. Um I would love to talk more about um some of these questions that we've heard. I'd love to um dig into some of the questions that we've heard. So um one of the questions we got in the chat, Liza, is um, are you able to convert from regular decision to early decision? Oh, yes, of course you're able to convert from early decision to regular decision. Just send us an email and we will change that round for you so that we make sure that our records are showing the most up-to-date thing. But if you do convert from a regular decision to early decision, do make sure that you're submitting your early decision agreement as well, because that's something that we're going to need from you. But it is totally easy to do that round change. Okay, um, next question is about, if, even though Holy Cross is test optional, will my score still be weighed the same as others in the application? Um, as in other, as other years in the application. So we've been test optional for about 15 years at Holy Cross. Um, and the reality is, is that if, you're, if you do submit scores, it's gonna be part of our conversation when we talk about your file, but it's gonna be a small enough part of the conversation that we could have the very same conversation without that piece. Um, if you don't submit scores, we don't think you did poorly. We just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. um, another question here was, can submitting a lower SAT or ACT score hinder my application? Um, you know, if you're asking us to evaluate a piece of information, it's going to be a part of our evaluation. But understand that standardized testing in general in the application, it plays a pretty small role, has to be a small enough role that we could do an evaluation without it as well. Um, how about, um, what about, okay, okay, so Liza, here's a question about the parent recommendation. Mm. So we do, once students apply, we invite um, a parent or a guardian to submit a recommendation. Um, how much weight does that give in the application? Mm. You know, I think there's... Um, well, let me, let me ask you differently. Yeah. When you read them, what, what are you looking for in that parent recommendation? You know, when I first started um, in the Office of Admissions and I was um, being trained and I heard that we allowed parent recommendations, I was sort of shocked. But, um, you know, our director of admissions, Lynn, put it very well for me is that these are the people that have known them their entire lives. And they if they don't have anything good to say, they're not likely going to write anything. Um, not saying that if parents don't submit a recommendation, all, it's not you're not a good student but that's that's besides the point i think the parent recommendations really they do make me smile sometimes there are some really sweet stories there are really nice anecdotes they just help us learn about who this student has been for the past 17 18 years of their life and i think that's really great and something really special that holy cross does um okay next question um can letters of recommendation be submitted after the application deadline um absolutely mm -hmm. um you know the application deadline is really more about when you should submit your portion of the common application um but we will certainly receive supporting documents after the deadline um sooner rather than later because we're gonna, we're gonna get to work on reading those applications but if it comes in uh, after the deadline um, that's totally fine um, what about extracurricular activities, Liza? What role do extracurricular activities play when you're reading a student's application? I think the extracurriculars just help us, again, see how active you are in your community and see what you have committed your time to outside of school and academics. For me, it's really nice to just see what type of interests you have. And there are so many students with a variety of different interests, working on the stage crew in their theater drama club, or if they're also rowing crew or sailing or anything or doing, I read someone today who's really into jujitsu and just a million different things and just a variety of different um, interests that students have. So it just gives us a little peek into the things that you're doing and the things that you want to spend your time doing and what you enjoy. So I think it's just a nice little, you know, again, the frosting to see what you're um, into. Um, first, I want to um, make a quick note. Um, I love all the questions coming into the Q&A. We're absolutely not going to get to all of these questions, but I want to thank you for all of your questions. Um, I also want to encourage you, um, if we don't get to your question tonight, which uh, for many of you we won't, um, you can absolutely follow up to uh, with us with an email 
um, to our email account at www.cross.edu or to myself or to Liza, all our contact information is on the website. Um, okay, next question. What weight does a uh, demonstrated interest play? And I'll, I'll say a bit about that. Um, we like to see that students have, have thoughtfully engaged in the admissions process. Um, there's always a benefit to thoughtfully engaging, right? You learn about yourself, you learn about the variety of colleges out there, you learn about our college. Um, you know, if you're logged into this webinar, the good news is you are thoughtfully engaging into the admissions process. You hear my words, you're, you're doing it. Um, it is, uh, though, to use Liza's um, culinary metaphor, it is in the frosting. It is not the cake. It is not going to replace um, academic merit. It is, uh, it is a part of the, the way we get to know you. And, and we hope that um, you've gotten to know us in some of the same ways that we really strive to get to know you. So it is a part of how we understand you, but it's not, not uh, one of the more important pieces of the application. Um, okay, uh, it, and I think that goes with interviews. Um, you just Can you say what you liked about doing interviews this year? Oh, I think it's one of my favorite um, parts of this gig, of this job that I have, is being able to speak one-on-one -on -one with pros prospective students. It's one of my favorite parts is just, again, similar to the essay, the interview does allow us to get a little more life and color into your application and we get to see how you speak, how you interact with other people, and we get to know you a little bit better and you get to explain your story and who you are and what your interests and your passions are besides what's on the page. So it's been my favorite part and I've made some great connections with students throughout this semester um, doing interviews. It's been great. Um, here's a question about, is there a way to submit additional essays or personal statements beyond what's in the Common App? Um, there's a few ways to, to add additional information. One is um, just by emailing us, um, we're happy to add information to your application. Um, we also um, have, uh, we'll also provide you that opportunity once you've applied. Um, we're gonna send you a link and in the portal, you're gonna be able to uh, fill out something called the Holy Cross response. And that's another way we're gonna ask for additional information. But um, however you get it to us, it's fine. We're happy to, to receive, we're an open submission school. So we're happy to receive any information that you'd like to add to your application. Um, okay, we have about two or three minutes left here. Here's a question that says, um, Liza drew absolutely won that debate. What is your favorite thing about Drew's debating? No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> um, Okay, how about this question? What part of the application do you find yourself looking at the most? Mm. Well, this might be technical because, again, I don't mean to age you, but I'm very new at reading applica <laughs> applications, so I do not have the skill of being able to pick out little things on transcripts. So, again, the transcript is the cake, and I am sometimes a perfectionist, and I want to make sure that I am counting every single course, and I am looking at it the most to make sure I have the grades right, the honors courses count right, the AP count right. Um, that's the thing that I find myself looking at the most. And I find myself actually reading just, if I have a bunch of people in my queue from the same school, I do them all in <laughs> in a row. Because for me, once I do one, I'm familiar with the transcript and I can do five really fast. So, but that's what I find myself looking at the most. Um, it's the I, most tedious. I, I think you're right, Liza. Um, it's the most important document in the file, the student's transcript, so it, it merits attention. I also think um, there, there's the most variety in formatting. Teacher recommendations are letters and they're sort of easy to read. Tra every transcript is different from every school across the world. And so it takes time for us to learn how does that school label its course levels? Mm -hmm. How does that school award grades? How did that school award grades during the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. during the spring of 2020? Um, we need to take time to learn that. Um, Sometimes it's just difficult figuring out semesters or trimesters or quarters or or what the requirements are, and course levels and what courses are available. So uh, there's a lot to learn each time you read a transcript. So that certainly is the most demanding part of an application um, read for us. So it certainly does take um, the most time. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. We got time for maybe two more questions. Uh, you've presented this as a debate, each presenting one side of the topic, um, but does but does it really just come down to who the reader of your application happens to be? 
So one thing I'll say about our review process at Holy Cross, um, we have a, a standardized way of reading applications. Um, the way we review transcripts is standardized. Um, now, there's a little bit of a personal side that comes in when you read recommendations and when you read essays. There's certainly essays that Liza might like that maybe I don't like as much. Um, and there's a few ways that we protect against that. One is we ensure that there's always two readers for each application. We have very differing perspectives on our admissions committee and that's on purpose. Um, while it would be great to have an entire admissions committee of Drews, that is really a dream come true. <laughs> but we look for more, we look for greater variety there. We look for more differing personalities and perspectives. And, um, and so we're gonna get that by having multiple readers. And then the application goes before a committee. And there we get a group of people examining the reader's notes and also examining um, the documents that were submitted on behalf of the student. So thereby we sort of protect against one person's bias or one person's perspective carrying too much weight in the application. Mm -hmm. um, I will, I'm gonna um, ask the last question and that's this, Liza. Um, why Holy Cross? Why is Holy Cross special? Like you're a graduate, you're an employee. Tell us why Holy Cross is different. It is this, I know this sounds like such, you know, a stock answer, but for me, it is a hundred percent true. And it will always be the Holy Cross community um, from being a prospective student when I was a Gosh. sophomore in high school and going on tours and going to different events, uh, shadowing classes, things of that nature. I just always felt welcome and at home. I never felt like someone who was touring a college. Like sometimes when I was touring at other institutions, I felt sort of like a fish out of water. At Holy Cross, I always felt welcomed and a part of the community. And there's just so many ways that Holy Cross students make everyone feel at home. And that is also a reason why I decided to come into this line of work is because I want to share my love of the Holy Cross community to all of the prospective students. So if you have talked to me in the past five months that I've been working here, you'll have known that I have always said that the Holy Cross community is what makes us truly special and unique. I don't think it can be said any better than that. Um, thank you, Liza, for um, your comments about Holy Cross, but also for your um, your sporting attitude when it comes to the debate that um, even my children think you won. Uh, thank you for all of our <laughs> attendees for, for signing up tonight. Um, keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, we do have uh, another series of webinars coming in February. We're gonna try to present more of a day in the life of a Holy Cross student, of multiple Holy Cross students. So keep an eye on your inbox and on social media because we'll have more news to come there. Um, this, is, uh, this has been a lot of fun Please uh, stay safe out there. Please stay sane out there as well. And please stay in touch. Uh, we've got lots more to come in the weeks to come. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Thank you, everyone.